In this video, we are going to take a look at the PIO peripheral of the new Raspberry Pi Pico, or more precisely, of the new RP2040 microcontroller designed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. If you've seen some of the impressive stuff that's been done with the Pico, you might have noticed people hooking up DVI, VGA, and other pretty high-speed buses directly to the Pico, even though it doesn't have native peripherals for a lot of these buses. The way most of these things are achieved is by making use of PIO, the Programmable I.O. Peripheral. The RP2040 contains two of these PIO blocks and they are pretty amazing. You can think of each of these PIO blocks as containing four tiny specialized cores doing super fast and freely programmable I.O. operations. And in this video, we will take a deep dive and check out what PIO is, how it works and how it's programmed. This will include a more or less complete description of all these supported instructions and I've created timestamps so you can directly jump to each of them. So if you want to come back to this in the future, you should be able to simply click the instruction or detail you want to learn about in the description and it should take you right to it. I also want to thank Luke Wren from the Raspberry Pi Foundation for helping me double check the correctness of this video. Luke is one of the main engineers behind PIO and he posts about some pretty interesting stuff on Twitter, so you should definitely follow him. So let's dive in. Each PIO peripheral contains four state machines and all four state machines are connected to the same instruction memory, which can hold up to 32 instructions. Now this might not sound like a lot, but it's more than enough to do some really impressive things. It's important to know that all state machines are using the same instruction memory, and that the memory has four read ports, which means that all state machines can access the memory at the same time without any delay or blocking or so. The instruction memory itself is filled by the rest of the system, for example by code running on one of the ARM cores. Each state machine also has two FIFOs, each with a length of 4 times 32 bits. One for sending data into the state machine, and one for sending data from the state machine back to the system. A nice feature is that if you don't need one of the FIFOs, you can reconfigure them so that both point in the same direction, effectively doubling either the transmit or receive FIFO size. The FIFOs are one of the ways with which the state machines communicate with the rest of the system, and so we can directly push or pull data into respectively from them, for example from code running on the CPU. Now, as said, the PIO is for dealing with I.O., and so we need a way to connect our state machines to the GPIOs available on the RP2040. This is done by the I.O. mapping, which lets us, per state machine, map pins as either inputs or outputs or both into the state machine. Finally, the PIO also contains an interrupt system. More on that later. Now, let's take a look inside of the state machine. First, let's look at the registers. Each state machine has three registers. The program counter, which is a special register and points to the currently executing instruction in the instruction memory, and two 32-bit wide scratch registers called X and Y. The state machine also has two shift registers, the input shift register, called ISR, and the output shift register, called OSR. Both of these are connected to the FIFOs. Then we also have a clock divider, which adjusts how fast our state machine will execute. The clock divider is directly connected to the system clock, and so our state machine can run at the full 133 MHz and drive IOs at that speed. The clock divider can divide the system clock by 1 to 65,536, with a fractional precision of 1 divided by 256. The state machine is also connected to the IRQ system. You will see how we can use that for syncing state machines and alerting the CPU later on. Finally, each state machine also has access to the GPIOs, via the I.O. mapping we just saw. Now there are four different I.O. mappings for each state machine. There are input pins, output pins, set pins and side set pins. We will see how these are used when we come to the PIO instruction set. Now let's take a quick look at the shift registers. Each of the shift registers is 32 bits wide and they can be configured to either shift left or right. The output shift register can for example be used to shift data directly onto the output pins. In this example we are shifting the two least significant bits from the shift register directly into IO0 and IO1. On the left the register is then filled with zeros again. The input shift register works basically the same way. So for example if we want to read data from a pin and send it to the CPU, we can simply shift the value from the pin into the shift register. We can also shift in multiple IOs at once, super useful for example for parallel bus systems. As mentioned earlier, the shift registers are directly connected to the FIFOs. This allows us to push the contents of the ISR into the receive FIFO and to pull data out of the TX FIFO into the OSR. What's even better, shift registers keep track on how many bits have been shifted into them and they can be configured to automatically pull or push data once they are full respectively empty. The threshold for what defines being full or empty is freely configurable by the programmer. 
Before we go on, let's also quickly look at the FIFOs themselves. Each FIFO has four stages with a size of 32 bits each, and on one end we have our CPU or other system peripherals, and on the other hand we have our state machine. The FIFO is aware how much data has been pushed or pulled from it, and so whether the FIFO is full or empty is detectable by our code. And that's basically all there is to the state machine. Quite simple, but also quite powerful as you will see. Let's also quickly talk about the interrupt system. Each PIO has 8 interrupt flags, which can be used to synchronize the state machines or provide lock-like functionality. The first 4 flags are also exposed to the CPU and can trigger interrupts there. The last big thing we have to look at before heading to the instruction set is the I.O. mapping. The RP2040 has 30 I.O.s and with the I.O. mapping we can connect them to our state machines in different ways. One thing to notice is that the PIO I.O. mapping internally works with 32-bit wide registers and so from the mapper perspective there are actually 32 pins even though only 30 physically really exist. As mentioned before, each state machine has four different sets of GPIO mappings. Let's start with the input mapping. For the input mapping, we can define the input base pin, for example GPIO 7. This pin will then, from the perspective of the state machine, be pin 0, and all the other IOs are simply counting up and wrapping around after IO 31. The output mapping works basically the same way, except that we also need to define how many pins we want to map as output, for example 1, 3, or 8, or even 32, again wrapping around after IO 31. Note that the state machine can also control the pin direction of all pins, except for the input pins, and that we can have overlapping mappings. The set and side set mappings work identical to the output mapping, with the exception that we can map a maximum of 5 IOs, and so for example we can map IO 19 to 23 as set pins, and IOs 5 to 8 as side set pins. And as said, all of these mappings can overlap without any issues. Now let's dive into the instruction set. PIO is programmed using a custom assembly language, which has 9 instructions and is assembled using the PIO ASM tool. The first instruction we will look at is the set instruction. The set instruction takes two arguments, destination and data, and the instruction will write whatever is in data into the destination. Data must be a value from 0 to 31, and for the destination we have a couple of options. Pins will allow us to write directly to IO pins, and here is where the IO mappings come into play. As explained, we have four different mappings, and as the name suggests, set will write to whatever pins are mapped into the state machine as set pins. We can also write to pin dears, which are the pin directions. A 0 for a pin sets it as an input, and a 1 sets it to be an output. Finally, we can also use set to write a value directly into one of these scratch registers X and Y. And so for example, set pins 1 would turn on the first mapped IO, set pin dears 1 would turn the first mapped IO into an output, and set pin dears 0 would turn it into an input. Next, let's look at the jump instruction. A jump instruction allows us to jump to different parts of our program, and so the jump target can be a value from 0 to 31. Remember that we only have space for 32 instructions, and so this is enough to perform an absolute jump to anywhere in our instruction memory. In practice, instead of using an actual value, you will see that most code will use a label, which by the assembler is then converted into an absolute address. The jump instruction also supports a couple of conditions, and so for example exclamation mark x or exclamation mark y will only perform the jump if x or y are 0. x minus minus or y minus minus will check if x or y is not 0. If that's the case, x or y will be decreased by 1 and then the jump is performed. And x unequal y will only perform the jump if x and y are different from each other. We can also jump depending on the state of a single pin. This pin ignores all the I.O. mappings and instead has to be set explicitly. The SDK exposes this function with the smconfig setJumpPin function. Last but not least we have the exclamation mark OSRE condition. Here a jump will only be performed if the output chip register is not empty. Now let's look at some examples. Here we have a label loop start, two set instructions which will first turn an output on and then off, and then a jump back to loop start. So this is an endless loop that will turn on the output for one cycle and then leave it off for two cycles. Next let's look at the MOV or move instruction. This instruction will copy whatever is in source into the destination. There are quite a lot of destinations available here, so let's walk through them. Pins, you guessed it, will copy whatever is in source into pins. Now MOV, unlike the set instruction, uses the output IO mapping. Next, we can copy something into our scratch registers X and Y, and then we have something interesting, exec. If we copy something into exec, it will be decoded as an instruction and executed in the next cycle. So in theory, we can execute PIO code from external sources like our pins or whatever. 
We can also copy something into the program counter, which will set the address of the next instruction that will get executed. And we can copy something into the input and output shift registers. The sources are similar. We can copy from pins, which will use the input pin mapping in this case. We can copy from our scratch registers. We can copy null, which will simply set destination to zero. And we can copy from status. Status is a special register that can be configured to mean different things, such as five for full or five for empty and so on. And finally, we can also copy from our shift registers ISR and OSR. A cool feature is that you can prepend flags to your sources. For example, an exclamation mark or a tilde will copy the inverted value and two columns will copy the source bit reversed. Next, we have the in instruction. The in instruction will shift bit count bits from source into the ISR, the shift register that goes towards the rest of the system. Bit count can be any value between 1 and 32 and the sources behave identical as before. Note that the pins will use the input GPIO mapping. The out instruction allows us to shift data from the OSR into a destination. Again, bit count can be 1 to 32, and again the destinations are pretty self-explanatory after the previous instructions. Note though that out uses the output pin mapping. Next we have the push instruction, which pushes whatever is in the ISR into the receive FIFO and clears the ISR. Push has a couple of optional arguments. If full will only push if the ISR is considered full. The ISR is considered full when a configurable threshold of bits has been shifted into it. If block is specified, the push will block in cases where the FIFO is full and wait for the FIFO to have space before continuing execution. No block ensures that the push will never block. However, if the FIFO is full, it will remain unchanged, but the ISR will be cleared. Push without any arguments is identical to calling push block and so by default push will block. Pull is the opposite of push. Pull will read data from the transmit FIFO into the output shift register. If empty, will cause it to pull only if the output shift register is considered empty and block slash no block will block or not block if the transmit FIFO is empty. Next we have the IRQ instruction. This instruction will set or clear one of the eight interrupt flags of the PIO. IRQ num contains the flag number and so it has to be between 0 and 7. And then we have a couple of options. Set and no wait are the default options and they basically mean set the flag and don't wait for it to be clear first. Wait will wait for the flag to be zero before setting it, making it possible to use it as a locking mechanism. And clear will clear the flag without waiting or anything. Finally, we also have the optional rel argument, which allows us to set interrupt flags depending on which state machine we are in. If rel is specified, the lower two bits of the IRQ number are modified by taking the two bits adding the state machine number to them and then performing a modulo 4 operation. This allows us to use different interrupt flags per state machine while running the same program on all of them. Let's look at some examples. IRQ1 will simply set interrupt flag 1 without waiting for it to be cleared. If it's already 1, it will simply stay at 1. IRQ wait 1 will wait for IRQ flag 1 to be 0 before setting it. And IRQ clear 1 will simply clear the interrupt flag 1. Now the final instruction, wait. There are different types of wait instructions. Let's start with the first one, wait GPIO. This instruction waits until the GPIO specified in num has the value specified in polarity. Note that wait GPIO completely bypasses the pin mapping and instead uses absolute GPIO numbers. Next we have the wait pin instruction, which works similar to the GPIO wait, but uses the input pin mapping. And finally, we have wait IRQ. This waits for an IRQ to be set. Polarity works a bit different here. If polarity is one, the wait instruction will clear the interrupt flag once it's set. If polarity is zero, the interrupt flag will not be changed. Wait IRQ also supports the optional rel argument, which again will modify the lower two bits in the interrupt flag number by a modulo four adding the state machine number to it. And that's all there is to it, all nine instructions. Now before we finish, let's have a look at three more features. The first one is the delay functionality. If you read PIO assembly, you will often see numbers in square brackets at the end of the line. These are used to increase the cycles an instruction takes. Normally, any non-blocking instruction takes exactly one cycle. Now often we want to perform cycle-precise I.O. for timing reasons, and let's say we want to create a square wave. This code has three instructions. The first one sets the I.O., the second one clears it, and then we jump back to the beginning. Now in this case, our square wave would look like this. The one is half the length of the zero. Not great for a square wave. Now, we could insert an additional no operation instruction that just wastes time, for example, move y to y, which does literally nothing. This gives us a perfect square wave, but it also wastes one instruction slot. Luckily, the PIO language has the delay feature. Instead of doing this, we can simply add a one in square brackets behind our first instruction, and now the instruction will execute and then wait for one more cycle. 
we still get the perfect square wave and we've also regained one instruction slot. The delay can be between 0 and 31 cycles, aka 5 bits. However, the amount of bits available as delay depends on another functionality called sideset. Sideset is the only GPIO group we haven't looked at yet, and it's used by a pretty cool feature. With each instruction, we can toggle the IOs mapped as sideset. For example, by adding side 0, we turn the sideset IO off, and with side 1, we can turn it on. We can set and clear 5 individual pins this way. Pretty sweet. This is super useful when implementing fast clocked signals such as SPI, as we can toggle the clock at the same time as we are shifting data out. To enable sideset in the assembler, we need to specify the number of IOs we want to use as sideset using the dot sideset directory. Note though that each sideset pin will reduce the bits available for delays by one. Now by default, if we enable sideset, we have to specify the value of these sideset pins on every instruction. However, if we add opt to the sideset setting, this becomes optional and the sideset pins will just retain the last set value. This comes at a cost though, as it will reduce the number of bits available for delays by one more. Sideset can also be configured to set pin directions instead of setting IO values. This is enabled by appending pindiers to the sideset directive. Finally, let's talk about program wrapping. A lot of PIO programs will consist of what's basically an endless loop, and normally when the last instruction of your PIO program is executed, the state machine will jump back to the first one automatically. But we can change that behavior using program wrapping. Let's say we have a program that has some setup code at the start, and then a bit of code that should be executed in an endless loop, and generates a square wave. This square wave will execute in 4 cycles, however, the PIO engineers figured that this is such a common use case that they introduced program wrapping. With program wrapping, we can tell the state machine at which point the program ends, and even better, from where it should start again. We simply insert the wrap target directive at the point to which the state machine should jump, and add dot wrap to the instruction after which the state machine should wrap around. This does not only save an instruction, but also because we don't have to delay because of the jump instruction, our square wave can run twice as fast. Now, that was quite the deep dive into the PIO architecture and the programming instruction set. In a future video, we will take a look at some example PIO programs and see how they work. If you already want to have a look, I've linked the Pico examples repository in the description so that you can already read some PIO code. There's also the often overlooked chapter 3 of the Pico C SDK book, which shows a lot of examples on how to use PIO in your C projects. I hope you enjoyed this video and to see you on this channel again soon. Thank you.